So thank you all for coming to this final fall event in the Department of English, Rhetoric, and Writing's reading series. Tonight's reading is sponsored by Barry and by the Georgia Poetry Circuit. It's my honor now to introduce to you Jeffrey Harrison. Jeffrey Harrison is the author of five books of poetry, including The Singing Underneath, selected by James Merrill for the National Poetry Series, and his most recent, Into Daylight, published in 2014 by Tupelo Press as the winner of the Dorset Prize. A recipient of Guggenheim and NEA Fellowships, as well as the Levon Younger Poets Award from the Academy of American Poets, the Amy Lowell Traveling Poetry Scholarship, and two Pushcart Prizes, he has published poems in The New Republic, The New Yorker, The Nation, Poetry, the Yale Review, American Poetry Review, the Paris Review, and in many other magazines and anthologies. He has taught at George Washington University, Phillips Academy, where he was writer in residence, College of the Holy Cross, Framingham State University, the Stone Coast MFA program, and the Solstice MFA program. Born in Cincinnati and educated at Columbia and Iowa, Jeffrey Harrison lives in Massachusetts. In an interview for the journal Smartish Pace, Harrison discusses the responsibilities of a poet, noting that perhaps honesty is the primary one. Honesty about oneself and about what the world is like. Elsewhere, he has said that for a poet, the one true God is authenticity but it has as many shapes as a Hindu deity. Whether he's writing a natural history of his yard or an encounter with John Malkovich at Tower Records, whether a poem setting is a walk among snow-covered trees or waiting at the DMV, Harrison's work embodies the sense of an honest and open approach to all he encounters, including himself. Into Daylight, he has said, is for him a book about trying to reconnect with the world and with poetry the decade after his brother's suicide. Despite the tangible grief in many of these poems, the dominant note here is the active practice of gratitude for the moment lived, no matter what such moments may or may not add up to. The speaker in his poem, entitled On Bitching, for example, ends by reminding himself to thank the gods to the end of your days for the time they've granted you to spend on making poems, even if they come to nothing. In the book's opening poem, Out Back, which on one level is a kind of ars poetica, a poem which embodies the poet's perspective on the making of poems, he begins in this way. The ferns, mint, foxglove, and tall grass surpass anything I could say about them. Better to let them all be, he writes, to take of them freely by other means and without much remark, the way the wind bends and jostles the ferns. Just enough snow fell last night to emphasize what's there, he writes in another poem, nothing fanciful, just enough to highlight the cables and to italicize the branches of the trees so that their complex articulations <coughs> might be legible. This snowfall he describes is much like the art of his language, for it is with such quiet attention to the small particulars that stitch self to world that these poems begin and end like the snow he describes being blown from the trees in sudden glittering puffs. These poems are literal illuminations, what we are left with and what we can be grateful for. Please join me now in welcoming Jeffrey Harrison. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, I've done seven or eight readings in the last um, five days, and that was definitely the nicest introduction I've gotten. Thank you. Um, 
So I am going to read mostly from this, this new book, Into Daylight, but I'm going to start with um, a couple of older poems. I'll just get myself together here. Um, <coughs> this one is uh, a little memory poem, sort of narrative poem, about something I mean I did to my younger sister when we were growing up. Um, this, this also has the distinction of having been plagiarized by someone, which really pissed me off at first, but then I, I kind of took it as a compliment. Our other sister. The cruelest thing I did to my younger sister wasn't shooting a homemade blow dart into her knee, where it dangled for a breathless second before dropping off, but telling her we had another older sister who'd gone away. What my motives were I can't recall, a whim, or was it some need of mine to toy with loss, to probe the ache of imaginary wounds? But that first sentence was like a strand of DNA that replicated itself in coiling lies when my sister began asking her desperate questions. I called our older sister Isabel and gave her hazel eyes and long blonde hair. I had her run away to California, where she took drugs and made hippie jewelry. Before I knew it, she'd moved to Santa Fe and opened a shop. She sent a postcard every year or so, but she'd stopped calling. I can still see my younger sister staring at me, her eyes widening with desolation, then filling with tears. I can still remember how thrilled and horrified I was that something I'd just made up had that kind of power. And I can still feel the blow dart of remorse stabbing me in the heart as I rushed to tell her none of it was true. But it was too late. Our other sister had already taken shape, and we could not call her back from her life far away or tell her how badly we missed her. And then this is a little different, a little urban nature poem about being in the New England Aquarium and coming to a tank that had this gorgeous jellyfish in it. Um, it was really, you know, they're always really well lit and they're like pulsing and um, weird but incredibly beautiful. Um, so uh, this is called Medusa and the, the, the jellyfish had Medusa in its name. Um, I forget, it was the something Medusa. It's all, it's all, it's pretty short, but it's all one sentence. Medusa. Like fireworks, but alive. A nebula exploding over and over in a liquid sky. This undulant soft bell of jellyfish glowing orange and trailing a baroque mane of streamers. So exquisite in its fluid movements, you can't pull your body away. This lucent, smooth, sexual organ, ruffled underneath like a swimming orchid, offers you a second-hand ecstasy, saying you can only get this close by being separate. You can only see this clearly through a wall of glass. Only imagine what it might be like to succumb to something beyond yourself, becoming nothing but that pulsing, your whole being reduced to the medusa, tentacled tresses flowing entangled in a slow motion whiplash of rapture while you stand there, an onlooker turning to stone. Okay. Um. Well, it's such a beautiful, beautiful place here. Um, I thought I'd, I'll read a poem, another nature poem, but one out sort of in the country where I, where I live in Massachusetts. Um, this is just about going outside, seeing a little rabbit in the, baby rabbit um, in the yard. And, um, and then it's also an homage for the, um, 
the Romantic poet John Clare, whose work you may or may not know, but he's a, he writes beautiful elemental nature poems. He wasn't as famous as Keats and Shelley and Wordsworth and all those guys, but, uh, but a wonderful poet. Uh, and he used to take walks and then write about what he saw, so, so I naturally thought of him. It's called For Clare. I saw a brown shape in the unmown grass, half hidden in a tuft, and crouching down to get a closer look, I found a young rabbit, no bigger than my hand, trembling there in its makeshift nest. I thought of John Clare. This was one of his creatures in my own yard, pressed close to the earth, timid and alone, almost a visitation <coughs> from the bard of the fallow field and the green meadow, who loved the things of nature for what they are. It didn't run away when I parted the grass and stroked its soft fur, but quivered in fear, the arteries in its small translucent ears glowing red, its dark eyes wide. I thought of keeping it, at least for a few days, feeding it bread and lettuce, giving it water from an eyedropper. Then it did run away, in little bounds to the edge of the woods and into the woods. I thought again of Claire, how after he escaped from the <coughs> asylum, he walked almost a hundred miles home, lost, delusional, beyond anyone's care, waking soaked in a ditch beside the road, so hungry that he fed himself on grass. That's a true story there at the end. Uh, he, he actually ate grass. Um, so here's another one set in my backyard. It's a little bit longer. And um, th that poem was, I was really trying to write the most simple poem I could write because that's kind of what Claire would do. Um, here we go. Uh, so this is about coming back from having gone to the eye doctor. And then it has a current event in it that will indicate to you how old, how long it took me to put this book together. This is one of the older poems in the book. It's called Vision. I just got back from the eye doctor who told me I need bifocals. She put those drops in my eyes that dilate the pupils, so everything has that Vaseline on the lens glow around it. And the page I'm writing on is blurred and blinding, even with these sunglasses. I'm waiting for the reversing drops to kick in. Sounds like something from Alice in Wonderland. But meanwhile, I like the way our golden retriever looks more golden than ever. The way the black-eyed Susans seem to break out of their contours, dilating into some semi-visionary version of themselves. And even the mail truck emanates a white light as if it might be as if it might be delivering news so good I can't even imagine it. Of course, it's just bills, catalogs, and an issue of Time magazine full of pictures of a flooded New Orleans that I have to hold at arm's length to make out. A twisted old woman sprouting plastic tubes lies with others on an airport conveyor belt like unclaimed luggage. And there's a woman feeding her dog on an overpass as a body floats below. Maybe we need some kind of bifocals to take it all in, the darkness and the light, our own lives and the lives of others, suffering and joy if it is out there, or something more like the compound eyes of these crimson dragonflies patrolling the yard, each lens focused on some different facet of reality and linked to a separate part of the brain we would probably go crazy. In my own eyes, with their single flawed lenses, the drops have almost worn off now, and my pupils are narrowing down, adjusting themselves to their diminished vision of the world. Um, okay, so Sandy referred to that, Mal that poem about John Malkovich, wh which I'm going to read now. But first I'll take it, it's three pages, so I'm going to take a sip of water. <coughs> so, 
in this in my previous book, I, I did write a lot of poems about my brother's suicide, and they're pretty dark, and I kind of felt that I wrote, those poems were maybe a little bit too much about his death and not enough about what he was like, and so there are a few poems in this new book that try to capture him more, and hopefully this is one of those. He was, um, he was really into this Malkovich's first movie, which a lot of you probably haven't seen. It's True West. It's Sam Shepard's play. And they made a movie out of it, and um, you may not, some of you might not even know who Malkovich is. Which um, he's an actor. He, the thing he's there's a movie called Being John Malkovich. He, he's been in a lot of things, but he's kind of a character, and he sometimes plays these extreme characters, and he does in this in this movie. Um, so my brother was. He was sort of obsessed with that. Uh, so I saw him in a record store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I think he lives for part of the year at least. Um, and uh, that's what triggered this. I think that's all you need to know. Oh, well, it also refers to Spalding Gray, who some of you might not know either, but um, he, he did sort of one person plays, but really he'd be sitting at a table on the stage, and it was a monologue, and he was kind of neurotic, and um, he sort of almost like a wasp Woody Allen. I, I mean, that would be the, the too simplistic way of describing him. Encounter with John Malkovich. When I spot him in Tower Records two aisles over, flipping through bins of discounted CDs at their going out of business sale, his shaven head half covered by the hood of his gray sweatshirt, my first thought is I want to tell my brother, but my brother is dead. And yet I watch him furtively, searching for some Malkovichian quirk, some tick that might make Andy laugh, but he isn't giving anything away besides his slightly awkward stoop over the racks. Then it comes to me that if I can't tell my brother about John Malkovich, I can tell John Malkovich about my brother, and my heart starts pounding. Normally I don't believe in pestering celebrities, but there are exceptions. If Spalding Gray walked in right now, I would definitely talk to him. But that's impossible, since he, like my brother, though under very different circumstances, killed himself. But John Malkovich is alive and standing right over there, and my mind is racing ahead to the two of us leaving the record store together, then having coffee at a nearby diner, where I am already telling him how my brother was obsessed with the movie of Sam Shepard's True West, and especially with him, John Malkovich, playing Lee, the older of two brothers. How Andy, who was my older brother, loved to imitate Malkovich, or rather Lee, everything from his small off-kilter mannerisms to his most feral outbursts, but even then he'd be smiling, unable to hide his delight. And how every Christmas he brought the video to our parents' house in Ohio, and our parents would groan when they walked through the room and sigh, not this again, or call it the most un-Christmassy movie ever made which is probably true, but for us, him and me, our other brother and our sister, but especially him, you'd have to say it was our It's a Wonderful Life. And I have to tell him how, how Andy used to cue the tape up and ask, can we just watch this one scene before, before whatever it was we were about to do, go out for dinner or visit our demented grandmother, and we'd watch him, John Malkovich, standing on a chair, shouting pronouncements, or destroying a typewriter with a golf club, and we'd go off laughing and exhilarated to our appointed errand, his inflections ringing in our ears. But now it's something about the way he thoughtfully considers his purchases, shuffling through them, then putting one back, reconsidering, his hand hesitating over the bins, that somehow reminds me of Andy and makes me certain Malkovich would be interested in him, a sympathetic character if there ever was one, funny, gentle, a lover of dogs and kids who had neither, with an odd sense of humor and some mostly unobtrusive symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder, who, like Lee, but to a much lesser degree, or so we thought, 
had trouble placing himself in the world. A part I'm certain Malkovich could play, all of it coming full circle, Malkovich playing Andy, playing Malkovich, playing Lee, or just Malkovich playing Andy, bringing him back to life the way Lee suddenly springs back up at the end of the movie, alive after all, menacing as death, the phone cord still wrapped around his neck. It turns out that John Malkovich and I do leave the store together. We check out at the same time, two registers apart, then head for the door. The moment coming to a peak for me as I realize my last chance is about to slip away. But Malkovich, in front of me, has to wait there while a stream of people coming in briefly blocks his exit. And I watch in profile his flurry of impatient blinking. Or is it a display of exaggerated patience? Each blink counting off the seconds he is forced to wait. Or the number of customers going by him, not recognizing him, it seems to me, though his hood is down by now. And I think, this is it. This little fit of blinking is the thing Andy would delight in most. The one detail he would rewind the tape to see again. <clears throat> okay, so this is a much shorter poem, kind of about my brother, but also about my son. He's now 23, but in this poem he's 19. It's called A Drink of Water. When my 19-year-old son turns on the kitchen tap and leans down over the sink, and tilts his head sideways to drink directly from the stream of cool water. I think of my older brother, now almost ten years gone, who used to do the same thing at that age. And when he lifts his head back up and satisfied wipes the water dripping from his cheek with his shirt sleeve, it's the same casual gesture my brother used to make. And I don't tell him to use a glass the way our father told my brother. Because I like remembering my brother when he was young, decades before anything went wrong. And I like the way my son becomes a little more my brother for a moment, through this small habit born of a simple need, which, natural and unprompted, ties them together across the bounds of death and across time. As if the clear stream flowed between two worlds, and entered this one through the kitchen faucet, my son and brother drinking the same water. Um, that, for those of you who write poems, and I know some of you do, because I just met some students, um, it might interest you that there was another stanza um, at the end of that poem, uh, and I suddenly realized right before it got published that the poem was better without that stanza. Um, and so that last line I never had thought of as an ending, um, but somehow, you know, when you put something at the end, it takes on a, a little weight. Um, so I'm going to read one poem from this book here. Uh, it's the last poem in here, and it's... This might only matter to me, but so I wrote about my brother's death for about three years, and that's all I wrote about. And this was the first poem I wrote that wasn't explicitly about his death, so I'm sort of attached to it for that reason. It does sort of take a darker turn near the end, um, and that's probably why, but, um, but I don't really explicitly talk about that in this poem. It's called The Names of Things, and it's about being in Maine in June, and so there's some flowers that you may or may not know. I always think that you guys, that the younger generation, have, have the opportunity to know more about stuff like nature than we do, because we had to use books, like field guides, to, to learn the names of things, and you guys have it all on your phone, so you could actually be easily, um, not to lecture you, but... <laughs> So you may not know the names of some of these things, but um, you may know some of them. The names of things. Just after breakfast and still waking up, 
I take the path cut through the meadow, my mind caught in some rudimentary stage, the stems of Timothy bending inward with the weight of a single drop of condensed fog clinging to each of their fuzzy heads that brush wetly against my jeans. Out on a rise, the lupins stand like a choir, singing their purples, pinks, and whites to the buttercups spread thickly through the grasses and to the sparser daisies, orange hawkweed, pink and white clover, purple vetch, butter and eggs. It's a pleasure to name things as long as one doesn't get hung up about it. A pleasure, too, to pick up the dirt road and listen to my sneakers soaked with dew, scrunching on the damp, pinkish sand. That must be feldspar, an element of granite I remember from fifth grade. I don't know what this black salamander with yellow spots is called. I want to say yellow spotted salamander, as if names innocently sprang from things themselves. Purple columbines nod in a ditch, escapees from someone's garden. It isn't until I'm on my way back that they remind me of the school shootings in Colorado, the association clinging to the spurs of their delicate complex blooms. And I remember the hawk in hawkweed and that it's also called devil's paintbrush and how lupins are named after wolves. How like second thoughts the darker world encroaches, even on these fields protected as a sanctuary. Something ulterior, always creeping in like seeds carried in the excrement of these buoyant goldfinches, whose yellow bodies are as bright as joy itself, but whose species name in Latin means sorrowful. Okay, so... So, I'll lighten things up a little gradually. Um, so this is an airport poem. Uh, there could probably be an anthology of airport poems. <laughs> People write them a lot. There probably is one. This poem is not in it, though. Um, <laughs> it's called The Day You Looked Upon Me as a Stranger. The day you looked upon me as a stranger, I had left you at the gate to buy a newspaper and on my way back stopped at a bank of monitors to check the status of our flight to London. That was when you noticed a middle-aged man in a brown jacket and the green short-brimmed cap I'd bought for the trip. It wasn't until I turned and walked toward you that you saw him as me. What a nice-looking man you told me you'd thought, maybe European with that unusual cap. Somebody you said you might want to meet. We both laughed, and it aroused my vanity that you had been attracted to me afresh, with no baggage, a kind of affirmation. But doubt seeped into that crevice of time when you had looked upon me as a stranger, and I wondered if you'd pictured him as someone more intriguing than I could be after decades of marriage, all my foibles known. Did you have one of those under-the-radar daydreams of meeting him, hitting it off, and getting on a plane together? In those few moments, did you imagine a whole life with him? And were you disappointed or glad to find it was only the life you already had? So she claimed not to have had that fantasy. <laughs> and I think we can trust her. Um, Okay, so uh, this is definitely lighter. What page is that on? Um, okay, here it is. So this is sort of a revenge poem for to a um, bad creative writing teacher. <laughs> it's called Fork. Because on the first day of class, you said, in ten years most of you won't be writing, barely hiding that you hoped it would be true. Because you told me over and over in front of the class that I was hopeless, that I was wasting my time, but more importantly yours. 
Because you violently scratched out every other word, scrawled awk and eek in the margins, as if you were some exotic bird, <laughs> then highlighted your own <laughs> remarks in pink. Because you made us proofread the galleys of your How I Became a Famous Writer memoir, because you wanted disciples and got them, and hated me for not becoming one. Because you were beautiful, and knew it, and used it, making wide come fuck me eyes at your readers from the jackets of your books. Because when, at the end of the semester, you grudgingly had the class over for dinner, at your over-decorated pseudo-colonial, full of photographs with you at the center, you served us takeout pizza on plastic plates, but had us eat it with your good silver. And because a perverse inspiration rippled through me, I stole a fork, <laughs> slipping it into the pocket of my jeans, then hummed with inward glee the rest of the evening to feel its sharp tines pressing against my thigh as we sat around you in your dark paneled study, listening to you blather on about your latest prize. The fork was my prize. I practically sprinted back to my dorm room where I examined it. A ridiculously ornate pattern with vegetal swirls and the curvaceous initials of one of your ancestors, its flamboyance perfectly suited to your red lipstick and silk scarved ostentation. That summer after graduation, I flew to Europe, stuffing the fork into one of the outer pouches of my backpack. On a Ural pass, I covered ground as only the young can, sleeping in youth hostels, train stations, even once in the Luxembourg Gardens. I'm sure you remember the snapshots you received anonymously, each featuring your fork <laughs> at some celebrated European location. Your fork held at arm's length with the Eiffel Tower listing in the background. Your fork in the meaty hand of a smiling beef eater. Your fork balanced on Keats's grave in Rome, or sprouting like an antenna from Brunelleschi's dome. Your fork dwarfing the Matterhorn. I mailed the photos one by one, if possible, with the authenticating postmark of the city where I took them. It was my mission that summer. That was half my life ago, but all these years I've kept the fork through dozens of moves and changes, always in the same desk drawer among my pens and pencils, its sharp points spurring me on. It became a talisman whose tarnished aura had as much to do with me as you. You might even say your fork made me a writer. Not you, your fork. <laughs> you are still the worst teacher I ever had. <laughs> you should have been fired, but instead got tenure. As for the fork, just yesterday my daughter asked me why I keep a fork in my desk drawer, and I realized I don't need it anymore. It has served its purpose. Therefore, I am returning it to you with this letter. <laughs> okay. Um, So this, this next one's kind of light, it's not quite like that though, but, um, so there was a news item about five years ago, maybe a little more, um, I heard it on NPR, it was that these computer scientists in England had figured out that the most boring day of the 20th century was April 11th, 1954. <laughs> it's nobody's birthday in here, right? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so then I did a little research online and I, and I um, wrote this. The day nothing happened. On that day in history, history took a day off. Current events were uneventful. Breaking news never broke. Nobody of any import was born or died. If you were born on that day, bask in the inverted glory of your unimportance. <laughs> no milestones, no disasters. The most significant thing going on was a golf tournament the Masters. It was a Sunday. In Washington, President Eisenhower, whose very name induces sleep, <laughs> practiced his putt on the carpet of the Oval Office, a little white ball crossing and recrossing the presidential seal like one of Jupiter's moons or a hypnotist's watch. 
On the radio, Perry Como was putting everyone into a coma. <laughs> But the very next day in New York City, Bill Haley and his comets recorded Rock Around the Clock, and a few young people <laughs> began to regain consciousness. While history, like Polyphemus waking from a one-day slumber, stumbled out of his cave, blinked his giant eye, and peered around for something to destroy. So after that was published, I got an email from somebody who said that the Masters was actually really exciting that year. And that I'm not being fair to Perry Como, because his father was a big fan of Perry Como's. I mean, Perry Como was before my time, so I could be doing an, an injustice, but that's okay. Um, so, just maybe a couple more, does that sound about right? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I read the John Clare poem. There's a number of poems, you know, so, that are sort of homages to other writers. There's Han Shan, the Chinese poet. There's Edward Thomas. There's I mean, a lot. A lot of people come up that I, you know, I hadn't expected to write all those, and they're kind of scattered through the book. Um, but this one's for Virginia Woolf. Um, and I didn't, I didn't read her until I was almost 50. And I then just kept rereading To the Lighthouse and Mrs. Dalloway, and also listening to them on CD. And then I moved on to some other things. Um, but this is about driving around in my car, listening to this wonderful CD of, of, of To the Lighthouse. Uh, and it's also read by a woman named Virginia. Virginia Leishman was, is the reader's name. And she has a beautiful voice, so I recommend that recording if you want to give it a try. Um, especially if you're having difficulty with it on the page. People say she's so difficult, but it's so beautiful that it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't really <laughs> matter if you're getting everything. Um, and that's true of anything, really. You can, you can get something out of the wasteland without really knowing exactly what everything is referring to. Um, anyway, it's called Listening to Virginia. Driving around town doing errands, I almost have to pull to the side of the road because I can't go on another minute without seeing the words of some gorgeous passage in the paperback I keep on the passenger seat. But I resist that impulse and keep listening until it is almost Wolf herself sitting beside me like some dear great aunt who happens to be a genius, telling me stories in a voice like sparkling waves and following eddies of thought into the minds of other people sitting around a dinner table or strolling under the trees, pulling me along in the current of her words like a twig riding a stream around boulders and down foaming cascades, getting drawn into a whirlpool of consciousness and sucked under swirling into the thoughts of someone else, swimming for a time among the reeds and glinting minnows before breaking free and popping back up to the surface, only to discover that in my engrossment, I've overshot the grocery store and have to turn around. And even after I'm settled in the parking lot, I can't stop but sit there with the car idling, because now she is going over it all again, though differently this time, with new details or from inside the mind of someone else, as if each person were a hive with its own murmurs and stirrings that we visit like bees, haunting its dark compartments, but reaching only so far, never to the very heart, the queen's chamber where the deepest secrets are stored, and only there to truly know another person. Though the vibrations and the dance of the worker bees tell us something, give us something we can take with us as we fly back out into honeyed daylight. And I, I'll end with um, <clears throat> the last poem in the book, which is a flower poem, but it's a pretty weird flower poem. Um, I was trying to transplant uh, foxglove from the Adirondacks, where I go in the summer sometimes, to Massachusetts, where I live. And they're biennials, which of course means they only live two years. And so 
you need to, they need to go to seed if you're going to get more foxglove. So they need to be pollinated, and the bees weren't finding them, and that's why the speaker of this poem is sort of obsessed. And plus, I was just trying to have fun writing this one. It's called Cross Fertilization. <clears throat> It's come to this, I'm helping flowers have sex. <laughs> Crouching down on one knee to insert a Q-tip into one freckled foxglove bell after another, without any clue as to what I'm doing, which, come to think of it, is always true the first time with sex. And soon Randy Newman's early song, Maybe I'm Doing It Wrong, is running through my head as I fumble and probe golden pollen tumbling off the swab. I transported these foxgloves from upstate New York where they grow wild to our backyard in Massachusetts, and I want them to multiply, but the bumblebees, their main pollinators, haven't found them, and I'm not waiting around. The only diagram I found online portrayed a flower in cross-section, the stamens extending the loaded anthers toward the flared opening. But the text explained the female sexual organs are hidden. Of course they are. Which leaves me in the dark, transported back to a state of awkward, if ardent, unenlightenment, a complete beginner, figuring it out as I go along, giggling a little and humming an old song as I stick the Q-tip into another flower, as if to light the pilot of a gas stove with a kitchen match leaning in to listen for the small, quick gasp that comes when the flame makes contact with the source. Thank you. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Sometimes it takes a minute. Oh, there we go. Hi. Um, did you end up telling the actor about your brother in the story? No, I didn't, I didn't meet him. But the weird thing is that um, the father of a friend of my kids does his uh, landscaping. And he kept saying he was going to show it to him, but I don't think he has. So, I, in a way, I mean, I want that to happen. But in another way, it, it's really not, to, I mean, it's, it is about Malkovich, but it's, that's not the main thing. So I don't know what he'd make of it either. But, he, you know, he's used to that kind of thing. There's a whole movie being John Malkovich. So um, <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. Yeah. Did that teacher ever respond in any way, shape, or form? Okay, so that poem is unusual for me in that the core story is true, but it happened to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was told that story, and I just said, can I write a poem about that? And, um, and it was easy to get into that persona because we've all been humiliated. And actually, and then I threw in a bunch of my own. The first thing that got said to me in grad school, in my first workshop at Iowa, was in 10 years, most of you won't be writing. Which I thought was really shitty. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and a lot of people in that class did go on to publish books, so, so that teacher was wrong, so that's nice. But, um, but so that was actually, in real life, a different teacher than the one uh, who, uh, that the, the poem is mainly about. But, um, so the core story is true. I embellished, I threw in my own experiences, and the only thing that is, that, like, the, this person did take the fork to Europe and did take pictures, maybe not in those particular places. And um, the only thing completely made up is, is sending it back. Sending the photos, definitely. Sending the fork back, no. So I think in real life, the teacher never figured out who was sending those photos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you prefer to write um, poems about your own life or about other stories that you've heard about? Well, usually um, about my own life. I mean, some people are really good at writing poems about history or poems from personas of historical figures or other or famous people. 
I've hardly done any of that. I mean, sometimes I write about, I've written about some historical figures, this obscure English traveler named Alexander Kinglake, who wrote the, really one of the first travel books. But usually I don't do that. Um, yeah, so, and people have all sorts of strong opinions about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I don't think it matters that much. People who, you know, people like to promote the kind of poetry that they write, so if they write a lot of persona poems, they think that, um, you know, writing about your life is sort of, I don't know, narcissistic. And maybe it is in a way, but, um, but they're probably narcissists too, so. Um, yeah, anything else? Uh, yeah. So as you were writing the poems after your brother's suicide, uh -huh. dealt with that? Did you feel at the time that you were engaging in a kind of a therapy with your poetry? And then in retrospect, do you still have the same feeling, whether that was, you know, whatever your answer is to that first question, did you change your view over time as you look back on that process? Yeah, it's really complicated. I actually, um, in the newer book, see most of those poems are in this book, and in the newer book, I have a poem about all my mixed feelings about <laughs> writing the poems in this book. And it's a Sestina, which you know has the same six words in the back. And I got them by going on Amazon and I there's they used to have a concordance and it showed you what the the mo the um the six the words that you use the most and, and I used the six words I used the most as the N words for the Sestina and um, but it's all about how you know Writing those those poems, the ones that I didn't read any of, the ones that I wrote in the year or so after his death, um, you really, I was really inside, like, you know, usually it's like emotion recollected and tranquility, words worth saying, but I, it was really, I was writing from inside an experience, because it just doesn't, you're just so, immer it's so huge and you're so immersed in it. Um, but um, the therapy issue is, the poems are, my newer poem talks a little bit about that. You know, it's, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm not really sure. I think in a way it was part of my grieving process, but I'm not sure. It's definitely not, the, the therapy thing is not like a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, uh, it, kept, it definitely kept me in it longer, I think, which could be good in the long run, I'm not sure, but um, I'm just not sure. I mean, some people who have had horrible experiences like that have, have told me that the poems helped them, so that, that's good. I mean, um, so yeah, that's not a very good answer, but, but I don't really have a really good answer. Yeah, yeah. And just to follow up, is there, you mentioned the Sestina, I associate that with mourning a lot. Is there a particular form of poetry that expressed your grief uh, better than others? Well, there, personally? um, yeah, well, there, there's a 12-part poem in this book, this, which is um, about the immediate aftermath of my brother's suicide. And, um, you know, as you get closer to like seven, eight, nine, you know, as it, they get more formal, um, you know, some of them were, had a lot of repetition and were kind of close to forms already. And, I, and then I thought, well, okay, this is almost a Villanelle. Why don't I try to see what happens? if it's better if I actually push it all the way to Villanelle. So there's a Villanelle, there's, and some of them found weird forms of their own, like um, there's a really skinny one, there's, you know, there's some in quatrains, but they're not rhymed, but, but there's a Villanelle, so there's the really skinny one right there, uh, and that's the Villanelle right there, and then there's a ballade of, um, of, of another French form, and there's, um, and I don't, I don't really know. You know, a few of my friends who were, you know, who are poets who were, um, who, you know, you show your poems to your poet friends and get responses, and some of them liked the earlier versions better of those particular poems, and other friends liked the ones that had ended up in forms better. Um, so, you're never really sure of anything, but, um, but yeah, so I think Maybe the form is a little bit of a metaphor for, you know, um, you know, Frost thing, a stay against confusion, and, um, you know, you're trying to make order out of chaos, and, um, 
But I mean, you're doing that anyway with, with free verse poems too, so you, you wouldn't want to be too simplistic about it. But um, I don't have one particular form, and I don't um, write in form that much. There's, you know, there's always a few poems in, in my books that are in form, um, and there's a lot of free verse, and there's a lot of sort of ghost um, iambic pentameter, but I kind of sometimes, I don't really like when things are too regular, so I don't really like, uh, I, I kind of mess it up sometimes on purpose, the pentameter. Um, there's nothing more irritating for me than end rhymed, end stopped rhymed lines that all rhyme perfectly, and I just hate that, you know, <laughs> and um, so if I do use forms, I try to use some off rhymes and a lot of enjambment so, so they don't ring out so much. Yeah, so that's, I, I think I've answered a different question. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Any chance of an encore of the jellyfish poem? No, we don't need to do that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> That'll just make me self conscious reading it twice. But thanks, that's a nice compliment. Yeah. Well, that, that poem went through um, a lot of revision, as I remember. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I remember reading Peter Bliss in this book, and I remember in Dr. Meek's introduction, one of the quotes she mentioned, I can't remember which one it was, but it reminded me of that and kind of philosophy of it. And so I was wondering if that or kind of some of the Eastern religions had influenced um, any of the thought of your poetry or anything like that. Eastern religion, yeah. Um, I've always been drawn, both drawn and somewhat reluctant to, you know, go all the way with, with that stuff. Like, I took an Eastern religion class in college. Um, I, have a, I actually have a poem in an early book about that. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but yes and, and not like I, I never really immersed myself. I mean, I, you know, back in the 70s I did Transcendental Meditation. and um, uh, So yeah, I've always sort of been drawn to that stuff, but, not, but never really followed all the way through, I guess you could say. And so that poem is funny. It's, it's, um, it's partly about my lack of being able to, you know, go all the way with that stuff. And um, I was listening to this guy. Uh, God, oh, Cor his last name's Cornfield. What's his? Does anybody know this guy? Um, Jack. Jack Cornfield. Yeah. So he he writes these books on Buddhism, and they're good. They're good. So and, and it's kind of like when I, tr you know, I tried to learn to play the banjo. Um, you know, I've, done, I've taken some meditation classes, but I end up only doing it during the lesson. You know, like I never really practiced the banjo enough or... Um, so, I don't know what that says about me, that I'm not that disciplined, maybe. I don't know. But, yeah. Okay. Speaking of discipline, do you have a standard writing ritual? Do you write every day? Or? No, I don't. No, we, I talked about that in, in class a little bit. It's, um, I'm just, I'm, uh, I mean, maybe I should do a little more of that. Because as you get older, you're writing a little bit less than when you were young. And you could just think of a poem, you know, all the time. And write in rooms full of people and not have to be, like, isolated. And uh, But, um, yeah, I mean, I try to get to my desk as much as I can. But life sometimes just happens and um, I think you have to you know show up they, you know they always say half of it's showing up and I think you do but um, I don't know if you I don't know if I don't know if the world needs a poem from me every day or a poem from anybody every day it's kind of that's narcissistic I mean, I, so I don't know um, yeah so I try to I try to um, be pretty good about it, and I want to be writing, and I'm not happy when I'm not writing, but, um, but I don't really have a, a ritual. Well, thanks. <laughs>